In this video, I'm going to figure out which one is the best Pokemon for a solo playthrough of Yellow version. Playthrough rules can be found in the description, so check them out if you don't know my content. Let's get into this one right away. I'm going to start off going through Magmar, just because I want to mention that the fire type has not been doing so well in solo challenges. Despite that, I think Magmar has the potential to redeem the type overall for a few notable reasons. So let's go through what makes it a Pokemon, and I'll explain why. For base stats, it has 65 HP, 95 attack, 57 defense, 85 special, and 93 speed. This gives it a 17.97% chance to crit in Generation 1. Throughout the video, I will do my best to explain generation-specific mechanics because there are a lot in Generation 1. These games are very quirky. So yes, crit rate is tied to your Pokémon's base speed in these games. It's very strange. Considering its base stats, Magmar is not more impressive than a Pokémon like Arcanine. That said, as things currently stand, the Fiery Dog does not have a good ranking in my tier list. So what's the reason? Well, number one, Arcanine has a slow growth rate, whereas Magmar has a medium fast growth rate. While this sort of thing doesn't matter at all in competitive Pokemon, it matters a lot in solo runs because the speed at which you obtain new levels really impacts how quickly you can take on the next major threat. So that is one advantage that Magmar has. Another one comes from its move pool. It starts with Ember, which in today's video is a major advantage. Being able to damage Brock's Pokemon with a special move right away is going to be so helpful. Through level up, it starts learning moves at level 36, just because you weren't meant to obtain Magmar early on into the game. It gets Leer, Confuse Ray, Fire Punch at 43, Smoke Screen, Smog, and Flamethrower at 55. When compared with both Arcanine and Ninetales, Magmar has an advantage here again because it does learn moves through level up. Those two do not because they are stone evolutions. In my videos in Pokemon Yellow, I am starting with my Pokemon fully evolved. This is just so we can accurately rank every species within the tier list. I'm sure once I'm done the original 151 Pokemon, I will go back and do evolutionary lines as well. Through TM and HM, Magmar doesn't get access to a lot, but it gets access to what it needs. Mega Punch, Body Slam, the three fighting type moves, Psychic, and Fire Blast. I hope that one of those moves really stood out for you, and that should be Psychic. This is going to be the secret sauce that gives Magmar what I think is going to be an advantage over all of the other fire types. I will talk about why in depth later on in the video. For now, I have a Rock-type specialist to deal with. Luckily for Magmar, starting with a Fire-type move, all of the bugs in the forest are very quick to knock out. This means my early game training is quite quick, and by the time I arrive at Pewter City, my Magmar is level 10. Before fighting Brock, I like to check my speed to ensure that I'm going to move first against the Onyx. In this case, with 27 speed, Magmar is, because Onyx only has 23. This is a first playthrough, and I am going to do more to get accurate results, so even though this might be a little bit risky, let's see if I can earn the first badge right away. Brock leads with Geodude. It has slightly lower special than the Onyx, so this is going to give me a sense for how many turns Brock is going to take. Looks like I am doing about a quarter to the Geodude every turn. Also notably I get a burn. This causes Brock to replace the move Geodude was going to use with a full heal. However, in Generation 1, when the AI heals a status condition like this, it does not undo the stat change. So if you look on the right hand side of the screen, you can see that Geodude's attack stat is now 11. My next hit is very lucky. It gets both a crit and another burn. By the way, Ember only has a 10% chance to burn. The status condition once again cuts Geodude's attack, so now it only has 5. And because Brock has 5 full heals per Pokemon, he uses another one, meaning Geodude only gets in a single tackle, doing a total of 3 damage before I knock it out. Okay, time for the Onyx. This one should be a little bit slower, and yeah, it looks like it's going to be about a 6 hit. It misses a Screech, then it uses Bind, doing kind of decent damage for Onyx. Tackle is doing about 4 damage, still all of this is not enough, and obviously Magmar finishes off Brock with great ease. That gives it a first split of 4 minutes and 2 seconds. And now it's time to introduce our second competitor, Electabuzz, the electric type Pokemon. And once again, I have to say that electric types have not been faring very well in my Pokemon Yellow challenges. Right now, if you ask me to rank all of the typings and how they do in solo challenges, I would probably put electric type near the bottom, perhaps with bug type below it, just because there are a lot of really bad bugs in Generation 1 and they don't really have a lot going for them. Also, there is no legendary bug type to overall improve the average. 
The electric type does have Zapdos, and I think that is the only Pokemon that has a chance to redeem this type. And we're going to get into the reasons why the electric type struggles so much throughout this first playthrough with Electabuzz. For now, let's talk about what makes it a Pokemon. For base stats, it has 65 HP, 83 attack, 57 defense, 85 special, and 105 speed, giving it a 20.31% chance to crit. As you will have noticed, it shares three base stats with Magmar, its HP, its defense, and its special. It has 12 less attack, but it makes up for that with 12 more speed. That being said, I don't like Electabuzz's stat spread, I much prefer Magmar's. In solo challenges, if you have somewhere around 80 or more speed, you're generally set throughout the entire run. Electabuzz's 105 is sort of overkill, and while this does improve its crit rate, it's roughly 2% better than Magmar, which is not a lot. And because of Electabuzz's move pool, I will not be able to leverage its high speed to get guaranteed crits with moves like Slash or Karate Chop. It starts with Quick Attack and Leer, then like Magmar, it starts learning new moves in the mid-30s. Gets Thundershock, Screech, Thunder Punch at level 42, Light Screen, and Thunder. Through TM and HM, its moveset is very comparable with Magmar's. It gets Mega Punch, Body Slam, the three fighting type moves, the addition of Thunderbolt and Thunder, obviously those two make sense, Psychic, and finally Thunder Wave. The developers wanted these Pokemon to be counterparts because they are version exclusives. Electabuzz is obtainable within Pokemon Red, and Magmar is obtainable within Pokemon Blue. Which is ironic, because the red Pokemon is in Pokemon Blue. I don't know why they didn't just put Magmar in Pokemon Red. It feels like that makes more thematic sense, but they probably assumed that kids were going to choose Charizard in Pokemon Red, so maybe it makes sense to give those players Electabuzz. Okay, so let's come back to what I was saying about Electric types not doing well in Solo Challenge. While with the fire type we have to wait till later in the game to find out why those Pokemon struggle, the electric types struggle immediately because of Brock. With Quick Attack and Leer, Electabuzz really doesn't have much play against him. Plus, because of my higher speed stat, my attack stat is lower, meaning Quick Attack will do even less damage. In the early game in Generation 1, there are no additional TMs, and because the level up moves come so late, I am going to have to use these two moves to get my first split. Complicating matters even more is the fact that Quick Attack is not that good against the bugs in the forest. As you can see here, it takes me multiple turns to knock each one of them out, especially the Metapod. This is unfortunate, I would really like to knock out Metapods if I can, after all they give better experience yields than Caterpie. I'm going to need to defeat most of the trainers in the early game for experience for Brock. I have to backtrack to Viridian City once to heal in the Pokemon Center. I'm going to skip the rival on Route 22. I'll talk about that in a little bit. After that, I head back to the forest to defeat the Lass, who is a Pokemon Yellow exclusive trainer. Then I defeat another Pokemon Yellow exclusive, this Bug Catcher. And finally, the mandatory trainer at the end of the forest. As progressing, I have been knocking out every wild Pokemon that I encounter. And by the time I arrive in Pewter City, Electabuzz is just over level 11. Okay, so let's head into Brock's gym. It's lucky I don't have only an electric attack, by the way, because then I couldn't defeat the junior trainer for experience. If you're curious what happens when I only have an electric move, just uh, stay tuned for a video later in December. By the way, this is the first video in daily December, so throughout the rest of the month, all the way until the 31st, there will be one fully produced video every day. I am really excited for what I have planned for all of you, so sit back and enjoy. I hope this month is going to be fun. Of course with Electabuzz, I didn't feel like facing Brock at level 12. I'm going to go over the next damage rounding threshold to level 13. If you didn't know in Pokemon games, the way the damage calculation works, it uses your level, and after using the level in a division, it truncates off the decimal point, so if you are not at certain levels, you actually lose out on a small amount of damage, and this has a major impact, especially at low levels. So when you level up from, say, level 10 to 11, and then 11 to 12, your damage grows linearly, and then when you level up from 12 to 13, you will get a larger boost to your damage output. The levels where this happens at end in 0, 3, 5, and 8. So with my Lectabuzz at level 13, and over 8 minutes on the clock, I am now ready to face Brock. Geodude is up first, this one is going to be our litmus test to see how the rest of the fight is going to go. First of all, I'm going to use Leer to lower its defense, just so that when I start attacking, I am doing the most possible damage. Now, I'm not going to go beyond minus two, because Electabuzz's crit rate means that eventually it's going to score one of these, and in that case, it'll bypass all stat changes, so if I set up to, like, minus six, and then I get a critical hit, I'll do less damage to the Geodude, which would be frustrating. Wasting time setting up also means that Electabuzz is going to take more damage from Tackle, and I need as much health as is possible to survive the Onyx. With minus two and one critical hit, Electabuzz finishes the Geodude off, 
with a total of 7 turns in battle. This leaves it with a little more than half health for the Onyx. What I really want Brock to do is go for Bide right away so that I can just continuously use Leer to lower the Rock Snake's defense as much as is possible. I get very lucky because that's exactly what Onyx does. I'm able to get minus 4 before Bide stops and then I can use Quick Attack to attack the Onyx, doing a surprising amount of damage. I was expecting less. Now, the fact that Electabuzz is very fast means that I always move first against the Onyx. Every time it goes for Bide, I can just start using Leer again, stall the Bide counter out, and then go back to using Quick Attack, dealing more damage because now the Onyx is at minus 6 defense. Still, things do get close because the Onyx has used Screech, and so when it attacks with Bind, it's doing 3 damage per hit, plus it's trapping Electabuzz. I go down to 10 hit points, surviving the Bind, and Electabuzz gets in a final Quick Attack, finishing Brock off. Its first split is 8 minutes and 50 seconds. That's more than double the time that Magmar took in the early game. That being said, it is not the worst Brock split we are going to get today, because our final Pokémon in this three-way is Jinx. On initial analysis, you look at this thing and you just go, oh my gosh, this Pokemon is the creepiest thing ever. Why in Generation 1 did they introduce Lickitung, Jinx, and Mr. Mime? I feel like they just wanted to terrify children. I personally consider these the three freaky Pokemon from Generation 1. Like, Lickitung is freaky, but also very cute. I do want to state that. Originally, I considered putting those three together in a Versus video, and then I thought that Lickitung was just too cute, so then I did a solo run with it. I figured I would put Jinx and Mr. Mime together, but then I realized that Mr. Mime is really good for a solo challenge. And Jinx is not exactly that competitive. The reason it landed itself in this video is because it's going to struggle against Brock. And that is despite its fantastic typing, Ice and Psychic. So to understand this, let's go through what makes Jinx a Pokemon. It has 65 HP, 50 attack, 35 defense, 95 special, and speed, which gives it an 18.36% chance to crit. Like the other two, it has a medium fast growth rate, but unlike the other two, it does not share a base stat total with them. Magmar and Electabuzz have a base stat total of 395 in Generation 1, whereas Jinx only has a base stat total of 340. It's also not a version exclusive, and it can be obtained in both red and blue version. That being said, it does feel like the third point in this triad, just because you have to use an in-game trade to obtain it. It feels like they wanted players to experience trading an NPC and getting a Jinx to then convince trainers to go and trade with another player to get, say, an Electabuzz or a Magmar. In comparison with the other two, they all share the same HP stat. Jinx's attack and defense are both significantly lower than Electabuzz and Magmar's. Its special is 10 points higher than the other two, and its speed is right in the middle, being 2 points higher than Magmar's and 10 points lower than Electabuzz's. I would really love this stat spread for Jinx if only its move pool was better. It starts with Pound and Lovely Kiss. Then at level 18, it gets Lick. By the way, in Generation 1, 2, and 3, Ghost moves all deal physical damage. At level 23, it gets Double Slap, another physical move, and then finally at level 31, it learns Ice Punch, its first special move. Beyond that, it gets Body Slam, Thrash, and Blizzard, the last of which has 90% accuracy in Generation 1. Through TM and HM, it gets Mega Punch and Body Slam like the other two, Bubble Beam and Water Gun for coverage, Ice Beam and Blizzard for same type attack bonus damage, the three fighting type moves, and Psychic, which is another same type attack bonus move. I think Jinx would be one of the best Pokemon to solo run the game if it started with Ice Punch, but without it, the early game is going to be absolutely awful because with Pound and Lovely Kiss, I am likely going to have to defeat Brock, unless I level all the way to 18 to gain access to Lick. But I really don't want to do that if I can avoid it, because if Jinx has to wait that long to defeat Brock, I don't see a world in which it can be competitive with the other two. In Viridian Forest, I face the first three trainers, which are all clustered around the entrance to the area. In order to defeat the final lass, I actually have to use Struggle, and so then I go back to Viridian City to heal. Coming back here isn't just a time loss though, because I can go to Route 22 and face the rival here for some additional trainer boosted experience. If you didn't know, trainer Pokemon give 50% more experience than wild Pokemon do. Obviously, I want to face every trainer available in the early game to give Jinx as much experience as is possible. 
Defeating the rival here determines which team he will pick in the late game. If you win in the lab and against him here in this optional battle, then he's going to evolve his final Pokemon into Jolteon. Immediately this seems like it would be an advantage, because if I skip the Route 22 fight like I did with both Magmar and Electabuzz, he chooses Flareon as his final Pokemon, and it doesn't seem like Jinx would stack up very well against that. However, the Jolteon is going to know Pin Missile, which is super effective against Jinx's Psychic type. That being said, Jolteon doesn't really have good attack, and the Jinx would outspeed the Flareon anyways. I think the Rivals team is not going to be much of an issue for it either way we slice this. I head back through the forest, finishing off the remaining bug catchers, and arriving in Pewter City, my Jinx is just about to be level 12. I fight the Junior Trainer in Brock's Gym to take it up to level 12, and then I have to head back to the forest to fight Wild Encounters to level up more. Electabuzz started fighting Brock just after 8 minutes, but Jinx is trapped in the forest right now training, because I think I'm going to need at least level 15 to beat Brock. At least that is the level that I'm targeting for my first battle against him. Now in the early game, the medium fast growth rate is the second slowest growth rate to level up. The ranking of the growth rates in the early game doesn't make a lot of sense. Medium slow is the fastest, fast is second fastest, medium fast is second slowest, and the slow fittingly is the slowest. Because of the medium fast growth rate, all this grinding takes Jinx a long time, and just before 12 minutes it finally reaches level 15. With that, at long last, Jinx is now ready to face Brock. This footage is going to go quite slowly because there is a lot to explain here. First of all, in Generation 1, when you get a critical hit, it does not do 2 times damage. Its multiplier is determined by your Pokémon's level, and this multiplier is lower when your Pokémon is at a low level and higher when your Pokémon is at a high level, maxing out at 1.95 times damage at level 100. That means whenever Jinx gets a crit with Pound, it is not doing 2 times damage, it just does a little bit more than it does with an ordinary Pound. So while these crits do speed up the fight against Geodude, they don't dramatically improve my result, and Jinx is taking 5 damage per hit from Geodude, so by the time Onyx comes out, I will only have 20 hit points left. You're probably wondering why not use Lovely Kiss here. After all, it has 75% accuracy, so it is a fairly reliable sleep-inducing move in Generation 1. This move seems to be the same as Sleep Powder, but it isn't because that move has 15 PP, whereas Lovely Kiss only has 10. Remember that Brock has 5 full heals per Pokémon. If I wanted to put the Geodude to sleep and keep it asleep, I would have to use Lovely Kiss 5 times in a row, depleting Brock's full heals, at which time I would have to use it a 6th time to put the Geodude to sleep, and then I would have to hope that that it would stay asleep. Of course then when the onyx would come out I would only have four lovely kiss uses left and I would be unable to put it to sleep. Because of course once again he has five full heals for this thing. However, there is an even weirder interaction here that I am specifically planning for and playing around. And that is whenever the onyx uses bide, Brock cannot use his full heals. So with Jinx I am just going to pound away at the onyx Eventually it will use Bide, and when it does, I'm going to put it to sleep. This stops the Bide counter, I believe it resets the damage to zero as well, and then I can use Pound, and Brock's Onyx has to wake up first naturally from sleep. When it does, Bide is going to resume accumulating damage, and that gives me another chance to put it back to sleep with Lovely Kiss. Using this method, I can chain sleep the Onyx, and slowly pound away at it, chipping its health down. This combo is so ridiculous, as I'm sure you are noticing from the footage, the Onyx doesn't actually attack once after it uses Bide, and Jinx knocks it out, earning itself its first split. Its time is 13 minutes and 10 seconds. If we look at the first three splits, Magmar's time is one third of Jinx's and half of Electabuzz's. At this point, it seems like things are all over for Jinx. Perhaps Electabuzz has a chance if Magmar runs into a lot of problems, especially in the late game. Do remember, Lance has a Gyarados, which knows Hydro Pump. So after the Brock split, it seems like we have a race between two Pokemon, with Electabuzz being the underdog, and then Jinx is just trying to make back some time and hopefully not finish too far behind the other two. A silver lining for Jinx is the fact that it had to overlevel for Brock, so the trainers on Route 3 don't take that long to defeat. And then inside of Mount Moon, just to the left of the entrance, I can pick up TM12, which is Water Gun. This is the first special move Jinx can learn, and I really hope that it's going to accelerate my rate of progress. In my first playthrough, I only make two changes to the game. First of all, I set my starter to whatever Pokemon I want it to be, and the second change is I give it perfect DVs to ensure fair comparison. In my follow-up playthroughs, I am going to normalize RNG even more by turning off wild encounters in locations like Mount Moon. 
In this case, with the encounters on, every time a Geodude shows up, I'm just going to knock it out with Jinx for a little bit of quick experience. Down the second ladder, I grab TM01, which is Mega Punch. And then I fight one optional trainer in this location, who is the Hiker. His Geodudes and Onyx are really easy to knock out with Water Gun. This levels Jinx up to level 18, where it has a chance to learn Lick. I do teach this in the place of Pound, but overall, this move is basically just useless. It's base 20 power, and remember, in Generation 1, Psychic types are immune to Ghost type moves. I defeat the Super Nerd, grab myself the Dome Fossil, and then I begin the long walk towards Cerulean City. While doing this, I always reflect on the choice that's awaiting me. Do I want to face Misty or the Rival? In this case, there is an advantage for Jinx defeating Misty first, because it would gain access to Bubble Beam, which will speed up Nugget. Bridge. This is incredibly important because Nugget Bridge has the highest density of mandatory trainers anywhere in the game, so getting more one hits really does speed up progress. That being said, Jinx doesn't have that many advantages against Misty, Water Gun is resisted, Lick doesn't affect the Starmie, and Mega Punch has bad accuracy. For those reasons, I felt that facing the rival was the safest choice. He leads with Spearow, I go for Mega Punch doing more than half, its peck doesn't do much, and I knock it out on the next turn. Sandshrew is luckily going to be a one hit with Water Gun, so he can't use Sand Attack. I continue using the special move on the Rattata, knocking it out in two hits, and then, because the Eevee has higher special than defense, I go for Mega Mega Punch, finishing it in only two turns. That fight was confidence inspiring, so I decided to go into the gym and face Misty next. Her first Pokemon is Staryu, I go for Lovely Kiss, putting it to sleep right away. My goal here is just to have as much health as is possible when I'm facing the Starmie. I'm able to knock the Staryu out with three uses of Mega Punch. Starmie is two points faster than Jinx, so it moves first, hitting a critical hit Water Gun, and then I miss Lovely Kiss. Water Gun hits again, taking Jinx to half, I put the Starfish to sleep, and now I can use Mega Punch to deal about a fifth to it. That being said, sleep lasts anywhere between 1 and 7 turns in Generation 1, and if the opposing Pokemon wakes up, it does not get a chance to move. In this case, the Starmie doesn't even wake up, I finish it off and earn myself the TM for Bubble Beam. I taught it in the place of Water Gun, but I really should have gotten rid of Lick. With Bubble Beam, Nugget Bridge is quite fast until I go up against this Lass. Her Pidgey lowers my accuracy three times, so this fight drains a lot of Jinx's PP. This is one of the reasons having Water Gun would have been better. Then I could have continued fighting, got the Elixir, and continued all the way to Bill's house, but I decided to backtrack to the Pokemon Center due to my earlier mistake. After saving Bill, there is nothing left for me in this section of the game, so it's time to head towards Vermilion City. On the way is Sandy. She can be problematic because she has three Pidgeys that know Sand Attack, but Jinx is one hitting with Bubble Beam. On the SSN, my first stop is the room with the Youngster so that I can gain access to the TM for Body Slam. This is a much more reliable move than Mega Punch, and it also has five more base power, plus a 30% chance to paralyze. Note that in Generation 1, normal type moves cannot inflict paralysis on normal type Pokemon. The next place I stop is the Gentleman's Quarters. There is a rare candy in here, so I need to battle him and his fire types in order to gain access to it. Luckily though, I have a water type move, which is kind of perfect coverage as an ice type. So I sweep through his team, grab the rare candy, and then I go up against the rival. If you've watched a lot of my content, you will be at this point wondering if I am skipping rest. And the answer is yes, I am not going to pick up rest with Jinx. Bubble Beam 1 hits the rival's first three Pokemon. Against the Eevee, I use Body Slam, knocking it out in two hits. And now, Jinx is ready to take on Lieutenant Surge. I spend a lot of time on the channel making fun of this guy. It's not because he's completely incompetent, he's just really inconsistent. For example, sometimes he uses Growl against your special attacker. I put Raichu to sleep, start using Bubble Beam. It hits twice, the Raichu wakes up. I try to put it back to sleep, but due to an X speed, the Raichu moves first, hits Mega Kick, doing massive damage to Jinx. Luckily I survive, but Lovely Kiss misses. I tried for Lovely Kiss again, Surge uses Growl, so Jinx survives. I put the Raichu to sleep, it wakes up right away, Bubble Beam gets a crit, taking it to red, and now we have to roll the dice. Is Surge going to attack? Because if he does, he's faster and he will knock Jinx out. And in this case, he uses Mega Punch, so Jinx faints and gets its first reset to Lieutenant Surge of all people. That being said, if he gets a second one, it would be so ridiculous. This time though, the Raichu goes to sleep and it stays asleep, allowing Bubble Beam to 4 hit, and with that, Jinx has its third split. 
it gets a time of 25 minutes and 58 seconds. Let's go back to Magmar and see how it can do during this section of the game, because while Brock was easy for it, Misty is coming up next. That fact might be the thing that evens the times out between it and Electabuzz. Inside of Mount Moon with Magmar, I'm going to fight some optional trainers, the Super Nerd by the entrance, then the Bug Catcher, and the last because all of their Pokemon are easy to knock out. Like Jinx, I can grab the TM for Mega Punch, but this is actually much more useful for Magmar because now I don't just have one move. Plus, it's worth reminding ourselves that Magmar has more physical attack than special, and I also have Brock's badge boost, which means my attack stat is 12.5% higher now. That means for the next section of the game, Mega Punch is going to be my go to move. There's obviously no choice to make in Cerulean City, of course fighting the rival first is the better choice. Spearow is a two hit, just like with Jinx, but then against the Sand True, Ember is not going to do enough damage to one shot. I get hit by a Sand Attack as a result, miss an Ember, and then knock it out. In the first generation Pokemon games, accuracy lowering moves are very potent. The first negative stage modifier takes your accuracy from 100% down to 66%. Using Mega Punch is even worse because now it has a 56% chance to hit. Luckily I do against the Rattata, knocking it out. I miss once against the Eevee, then take it to under half health, and eventually I am able to finish it off with Ember. As I start the return journey to Cerulean City, I have to make a choice. Is my level 22 Magmar ready to face Misty? or should I go to the SSN first? In this case, I think it's a no-brainer. Going to the SSN is just so much more reliable. Sandy is fundamentally more inconsistent with Magmar just because Mega Punch is my go-to move here. Luckily, it's one-shotting all of her birds. On the SSN, things are a little bit different. While I do pick up Body Slam first, then I make my journey over to the right portion of the ship to gain access to the TM for rest. This move can be very useful at the end of Pokemon Yellow, and I consider obtaining it the safe first playthrough play. Magmar is doing very well in this run so far, so I figured that investing a little bit of extra time to be safe later on was a good trade-off. The rival on the SSN is not a problem, and now I have to backtrack to Cerulean City. Sometimes people comment saying that I should take on Lieutenant Surge before going back, but that isn't possible. Uh, as you can see here, I forgot that I had not faced Misty, and no, you cannot cut trees unless you have her badge. So I used Diglett's Tunnel to fittingly use Dig to head back to Cerulean City. You cannot use the Pokemon Fan Club house in yellow version. That only works in red and blue. Alright, so let's see how my level 25 Magmar does against Misty. Staryu is first, I go for Body Slam and knock it out in one hit. That's a good start. Starmie is next, Magmar is faster, Body Slam hits, and does more than half, actually much more than half because of a critical hit. Starmie only survives on red health. It uses Water Gun, which does about a third, obviously not enough, and with that, Magmar defeats Misty. I go back to Vermilion City immediately to defeat Surge. His badge gives you access to fly once you reach Celadon, and backtracking through the middle of the map and Saffron City later on is slower, so fighting him now is going to save some time later. I respect him so little as a trainer that I didn't even heal before this fight, which turns out to be a mistake because he uses Growl, then crits with Mega Punch twice in a row, knocking Magmar out. So just like Jinx, it had its first reset here. I'm really hoping that Electabuzz doesn't, that would be very disappointing. In the next fight, things go better. I crit with Body Slam, taking the Raichu down to orange health. My next one just barely doesn't knock it out, but it causes paralysis, and then I finish it off. Magmar gets a surge split of 16 minutes and 25 seconds. Despite Misty and some backtracking time, it has retained its lead when compared with Jinx. But what about Electabuzz in this section of the game? Theoretically, it should be strong against Misty, and this is where I have really bad news, because it learns Thundershock, its first same type move, at level 34. So I'm going to have to go through this next section of the game with neutral normal type moves. At least I can rely on Mega Punch, which is better than Quick Attack. As I clear Jesse and James, just note that I didn't do as much training in Mount Moon with Electabuzz as I did with Magmar. I figured I would need more levels with it, just because Misty has a type advantage. That being said, as I arrive in Cerulean City, I'm going to face the rival right away with Electabuzz, because the Electric type does not resist the Water type, so Misty would likely be too strong for me to defeat right now. Of all the three Pokemon I have used so far, Electabuzz is the worst against the rival Sandshrew. In this case, things are even worse because Spearow is first. As an electric type, it feels really bad to have to say that. But yeah, this thing knows Growl, so it lowers my attack stat. 
As a result, the Sandshrew is going to take three turns, maybe four turns to knock out with Mega Punch. In this case, it goes for Sand Attack, which causes the badge boost glitch, increasing my attack stat by three points. This does give me the three hit in this instance, and despite the accuracy drop, Electabuzz doesn't have accuracy problems, and I am able to win. At the very end of Nugget Bridge, after I obtain my first HM user, Charmander, I can pick up the TM for Thunder Wave. Normally I skip it, today I made a little mistake, jumped down the ledge and had to go back for it, but today I will pick it up and teach it to Electabuzz because it gives it decent utility. And yes, this is technically my first same type move, but it doesn't deal damage. Following that acquisition, I have to face a hiker, either this guy with a Machop and a Geodude, or a guy with an Onyx. I usually fight this guy specifically because I can obtain a hidden elixir after defeating him, and this allows me to replenish my PP and continue with the route. I wanted to draw attention to this fight with Electabuzz, because using Mega Punch against Geodude doesn't feel very good. I also run out of power points and have to finish it off with Quick Attack. Surprisingly though, this fight doesn't take as long as I was expecting. With Route 25 complete, I head back to Misty's Gym to take on the second Gym Leader. Staryu is first, I go for Mega Punch, doing more than half, it uses Water Gun, which doesn't do much, and then I get a Generation 1 miss on Quick Attack. This is a 1 in 256 chance. All moves can miss like this, provided they don't bypass accuracy checks. Even with an X Defend, her lead goes down on the next turn, and she sends in her Ace. To make it less consistent, I inflict Paralysis with Thunder Wave. Water Gun isn't doing that much. My Mega Punch gets a critical hit, doing more than half. And just like Magmar, Electabuzz crits two turns in a row, but in this case, unlike Magmar, this is relevant because the second crit gives me the knockout. Again, Sandy, everything is exactly the same with Electabuzz as it was with Magmar. On the SSN, I do the exact same things, Body Slam first, then pick up Rest. By the way, this move is going to be much more important with Electabuzz. The Rival is the last thing that I have to do here. Once again, the Sandshrew lowers my accuracy. It doesn't cause a loss, though. And let's get to facing Surge, because Electabuzz really needs an Electric-type attack. When compared with Magmar, Electabuzz is faster than the Raichu naturally, which is an advantage. That being said, it has less physical attack, so Body Slam does less than half, and Raichu's Mega Punch, which crits, does more. Okay, are all three of the Pokemon going to get resets here? My next Body Slam does not crit, so Raichu gets another attack, but it misses Mega Punch, and Electabuzz takes the win. It clocks in with a surge split of 21 minutes and 35 seconds. Looking at this real time by trainer graph, we can see that the splits obtained during the Brock portion of the game have basically just been replicated here at Surge. No major shakeups have occurred. That being said, if we look at the bar graph for the splits, we can really see that these three Pokemon play fundamentally differently. Jinx's Brock split is outrageously long, and then its Misty and Surge splits are both quite even. Magmar has a short Brock split, a long Misty split, and then an incredibly short Surge split. Whereas Electabuzz is the most evenly distributed of the three. It's setting the most regular pace. Let's continue with it through the next section of the game. When teaching Thunderbolt, I'll note a small mechanic that I do to minimize the amount of time spent in my inventory. My goal in this case is to move the bike to the top slot so that I can easily access it throughout the rest of the playthrough. So I can press select when my inventory opens on the first slot item, and then scroll all the way down to the bottom of the bag. This is where the bike is stored because it was the last item that I picked up. Then I can press shift again, switching the bike to the first position, but my cursor remains at the bottom of the inventory. Just one item above this is the TM for Thunderbolt, which I can teach to Electabuzz. This resets the position of my cursor to the top of the bag for convenience the next time I open it. Okay, so the next trainer is the Wrapping Lass. Now, Electabuzz is really set up for success against her. The strategy that I'm worried about here is the first Oddish using Stun Spore, cutting my speed, and then the Bellsprout can waste a lot of my time using Wrap and potentially knock my Pokemon out. With Electabuzz, that is not a possibility because I have Quick Attack. While Paralysis would be annoying, I would always have priority. Plus, in this case, Electabuzz is always getting one hits with Body Slam, so the only way to get paralyzed would be a Gen 1 miss. Just inside of Rock Tunnel though, I have to face a Pokemaniac, and this has the potential to be much more difficult. His first Pokemon is Cubone, and it knows Bone Club. Plus, the ground type has decent defense, so Body Slime is going to 3 hit. Bone Club just misses though, so I knock the Cubone out for free, move on to the Slowpoke, and I can just one-shot it with Thunderbolt. But of course, he is not the most difficult trainer in here, because at the end of Rock Tunnel is the self-destructing hiker. He has two Geodudes and one Graveler, and all of them know Self-Destruct. When this move calculates damage, it halves the target's defense stat, so it is going to deal a lot to Electabuzz. That being said, remember when I picked up Rest and said it was important? Yeah, I'm going to teach it to Electabuzz now. 
With it, I can heal if I take too much damage from self-destruct and continue the fight. Well, that is if the Geodude doesn't get a critical hit and knock Electabuzz out in one turn. I cannot believe that just happened. That's my first reset in this playthrough. Remember, crit rate is calculated using the Pokemon's base speed. Geodude has 20 base speed, giving it a 3.9% chance to critical hit. In the next fight, things are much more straightforward. Self-Destruct still does a lot of damage to Electabuzz, but I can just heal, move on to the next Pokemon, it self-destructs, I heal one more time, survive the Graveler self-destruct, and I've cleared the Hiker. With him out of the way, it's now time for what I consider to be the mid-game. In Celadon City, I decide to go to the hideout. This is so I can collect a bunch of high-priced items to sell for vitamins in the department store. I also really want the extra rare candy, because of the three Pokemon I am running today, I think Electabuzz is going to have to finish at the highest level. That's because the champion starts the fight off with a Sand Slash that knows Earthquake. In the department store, I have enough money to buy five vitamins. I invest in calcium for this playthrough, and we will discuss that decision in detail later on. The rival in Pokemon Tower is next, and this is where Electabuzz really starts to feel like it's getting into its stride. I'm able to one-shot the Fero, almost one-shot the Magnemite using Body Slam, obviously one-shot the Shelder, two-shot the Santru, miss a little bit against the Eevee because of an accuracy drop, and eventually knock it out. The first Chandler in the tower, who I call Agatha Jr., has two Ghastly, and she can be problematic if you're not able to one-hit her Pokemon, but with Thunderbolt, Electabuzz is able to. At the top of the tower against Jesse and James, I'm going to discuss a small mistake that I made with Electabuzz. After obtaining Fly, I should have gone back to Celadon City and then opened the way to Saffron and obtained the TM for Psychic. I could have taught it to Electabuzz to speed up my results in Pokemon Tower. After all, this move likely would have knocked out the Magnemite and Sandshrew in a single hit. Plus, it would have helped here against both Arbok and Weezing. After obtaining the Poke Flute, I had realized what my mistake was, so I go to Saffron City, pick up the TM for Psychic, and teach it to Electabuzz in the place of Thunder. Wave. On Cycling Road, I pick up a PP up using this on Psychic because it doesn't have that many uses. I don't fight any optional trainers here, progressing to the Safari Zone as fast as possible, and after I obtain Surf, I dig back to Celadon City. Because I have Psychic, I figure I can go to the gym, battle only the mandatory trainer, and face Erica next. Tangle is first, I go for Psychic against it just in case I get special drops. Turn 1 I do, by the way this is a 33% chance, as a result I'm able to knock it out in 3 hits and move on to the Weeping Bell. It's part poison type so Psychic does super effective damage, but it's not enough to knock it out, probably because I'm on par with her in terms of levels. Acid does very little to me, I finish it off and move on to her final Pokemon Gloom. Psychic does more than half, Gloom uses Sleep Powder, and Electabuzz goes to sleep. Alright that's concerning, it goes for Petal Dance next, which is doing a decent amount each turn. Okay, sleep, please do not last too long. After I survive all of the pedal dances, Gloom gets confused, and it actually ends up knocking itself out. Electabuzz didn't even wake up. With a hilarious victory, Electabuzz earns itself a fourth split of 34 minutes and 20 seconds. Now for anyone who's a Jinx fan, I hope you realize that the next section of the game is going to really speed up its progress, so it has a chance to make back some of the time it has lost. Outside of Cerulean City, when I face the Wrapping Lass, you can see that Jinx has worse damage ranges with Body Slam, so I have to put Aradish to sleep with Lovely Kiss to avoid getting hit by Stun Spore. Unfortunately for me, the first one misses and I get paralyzed, so I have a quick reset here before trying the fight again and being successful with the sleep-inducing move. Things don't immediately improve because the slow poke are slow to knock out. They take four hits to go down from Body Slam. By the way, as a kid, I hated facing these Pokemon. They always felt like such a slog. However, with them out of the way, now things speed up. All of the self-destructing hikers Pokemon are one hits, and Jinx makes it to Celadon City. Now wake up everyone because this is where the run fundamentally changes. After exploring the hideout and obtaining the rare candy, in the department store on the top floor, I can talk to this girl, trade a fresh water, and get the TM for Ice Beam. I do want to note the tragic timing of this move because Jinx is level 30, and at just level 31 it would learn Ice Punch. If only I could have got Ice Punch at level 18. My production code name for this project has been the Elemental Punches, but unfortunately Jinx is never going to use hers. Instead, I'm going to teach Ice Beam in the place of Lick, and now I have a same type attack bonus move. Mirroring Electabuzz, I buy 5 Calcium to improve Jinx's special, and then with Fly, I am not forgetful, heading to Saffron City to obtain the TM for Psychic. 
I teach this one in the place of Bubble Beam, just because Body Slam's physical damage is going to have a little bit more utility against Psychic types. At least that was my assumption in this first run. Okay, are you ready to watch Jinx steamroll the rival? Ice Beam 1 hits the Fero, Psychic 1 hits the Shelter, Ice Beam 1 hits the Vulpix. Yes, Fire types do not resist Ice moves in Generation 1. Sandshrew falls to Ice Beam, I have a chance to learn Ice Punch, obviously gonna say no today. And then, I 1 hit the Eevee with a critical hit Ice Beam. Of course the Chandler is no problem because I have Psychic, and I also one hit all of Jesse and James's Pokemon. Jinx is now on an absolute tear. Before going to Cycling Road in the Safari Zone, I head to Erica's gym, defeat only the Mandatory Trainer, and then take on the Grass-type Specialist. This one should be very easy. Ice Beam 1 hits the Tangela, it is the bulkiest Pokemon she has, and because of that I'm able to one-shot both the Weeping Bell and the Gloom, and Jinx clocks in with a 36 minute and 38 second Erica split. Do remember, it finished the Safari Zone, whereas Jinx hasn't. The Erica split is the last time I like to compare results in these videos, just because the final gym leaders can all be fought in different orders. So let's catch up with Magmar and see how it does in this section of the game. Against the wrapping last note that I am using Body Slam, this is because it does more damage than Ember. For example against the Oddishes, with Ember I have a 10% chance not to knock them out, whereas Body Slam is a guaranteed one hit. The Pokemaniac inside of Rock Tunnel would be much scarier if his Slowpoke had a water type move, but it doesn't and Body Slam does a lot of damage. Of course the most worrying fight is the one against the self-destructing Hiker. I could have taught Rest mirroring Electabuzz's approach, but I didn't want to do that because I want more moveset flexibility throughout the mid-game. I'm saving Rest for the very end of the game with Magmar. Using Ember I knock out the first Geodude, the second one self-destructs, and takes me down to just above half health. I was fairly certain that Graveler would knock me out with the self-destruct, but it doesn't use it, and Magmar defeats him on its first attempt. We'll jump ahead to the department store, I did go through the hideout like the other two, and I am once again going to use Calcium on Magmar. This serves more purposes than it does with the other Pokemon, because boosting my special also serves defensively against water type moves, and that's going to be very important against Lance. I pick up the TM for Psychic, teaching it in Magmar's empty slot, and then crush the rival in Pokemon Tower. On Cycling Road I fight one trainer, the guy with five Pokemon, for his fantastic experience yields, and then, after the Safari Zone, I'm ready to face Erica. The Tangela that is first is the only Pokemon that takes more damage from Ember. I use it to two-shot, and then against Weepin' Bell, Psychic is doing more. Not enough to one-hit, though. I finish it off in two hits, move on to the Gloom, hopefully no Sleep Powder here. Erica uses a Super Potion instead, and I finish her off. Magmar gets a split of 29 minutes and 33 seconds. Once again examining the real times, none of our placements have changed. Jinx is in last place, and Magmar is leading. Both Electabuzz and Jinx got major moveset upgrades, and while Magmar now does have Psychic, this utilizes its lower offensive stat. It doesn't get a better normal type move unless you teach it Hyper Beam, but that is not practical within a challenge like this, because you have to buy coins 50 at a time to obtain the TM from the game corner. That wastes way too much real time, and as a result it's not going to be an option today. The next thing I'm looking forward to getting with Magmar is an upgrade to my fire type move, which comes at level 43 in the form of Fire Punch. That being said, by the time I make it to Koga, my Magmar is just about to level up to 38. I didn't want to use Rare Candies and waste all that experience, plus I have super effective damage against his team, so let's see how this goes. He leads with a level 44 Venonat. I go for Psychic, and I don't one-shot. Then his Venonat Psychic gets a special drop, and things are not looking good for Magmar from here. His lead goes down, I crit the second Venonat, knocking it out in one turn, and then I decided to see how much damage Body Slam would do on the third one. The answer is less than half. Once again, Psychic lowers my special, Venonat uses Toxic, the Venomoth comes out, and knocks Magmar out with a Psychic. That's the Fire-type's second reset. This fight's going to be easier once I'm higher level and I have Fire Punch, so instead I'm going to go to Sylph first. I can fight some optional trainers in here to level Magmar up, in this case to level 40, and then I decided to take on the rival. He leads with Sand Slash, and this thing is starting to become a problem. In this case it knows Sand Attack and Slash, which has a high critical hit rate. Luckily, it just goes for Swift, and I knock it out basically for free. Next is Cloister, it has low special. I get a critical hit, but still Psychic doesn't knock it out. It just goes for Withdraw, and I take it down on the next turn. The Magneton in this battle is not that intimidating, because it doesn't yet have Thunder Wave. Also, it's doing very little using Thundershock, and despite getting two hits in, I knock it out. 
Magmar is faster than the Kadabra, finishing it with a single body slam, and so I have made it to the Flareon. I do more than half, cause paralysis, Flareon's bite doesn't do that much, and I've won. While Giovanni has rock and ground types, he's really not hard for Magmar to deal with, plus Psychic is super effective against his Nidoqueen, allowing me to knock it out in only two turns. This just barely doesn't give me enough experience to level up to 43. I went back to fight Koga right away, knowing that Psychic would one-shot the first Venonat, giving me the level up, and with it, Fire Punch. I teach it in the place of Amber. By the way, I have Confuse Ray on my set, but it's not going to be useful. Now with super effective fire damage, I can knock out the two following Venonats in one hit each. That leads to Koga's Ace, Venomoth. At this level I'm faster, my Fire Punch does more than half and causes a burn, which is good because Venomoth starts setting up double team, it gets really annoying and I miss a lot, but eventually it's going to go down because of the status. However, when it's an inch from fainting, Magmar hits a Fire Punch and that's that for Koga. With the Soul Badge I can now surf outside of battle and go to Cinnabar Island to face Blaine. Against him, I go for Psychic on the first turn, just in case it lowers Ninetales special. It doesn't, so I figured Body Slam would be doing more damage, and it is. Unfortunately, just not quite enough to knock it out with my next hit. As a result, Magmar has its defense lowered twice by Tail Whip, and then when Rapidash uses Takedown, I survive with only 9 hit points. While I finish Blaine's second Pokemon off, Arcanine comes out and finishes Magmar, giving it its third reset. At this point with Magmar, I figured it was the best thing to do some additional training. I fight all the trainers in Blaine's gym. These people aren't great experience yields. If I was doing this playthrough today, I definitely wouldn't be fighting them. That said, this experience brings Magmar up to level 45, and then I head to the fighting dojo. Defeating the Fighting Master here brings Magmar up to level 47, and since I'm right beside Sabrina's gym with 136 speed, I'm gonna face her now. Obviously Body Slam 1 hits the Abra, but the Kadabra survives on red health. I get lucky because it chooses Recover instead of attacking or using Kinesis, and I knock it out for free. Last is Alakazam, I outspeed, Body Slam does more than half, it sets up Reflect, but Magmar crits on the next turn, and with that, Sabrina is defeated. With her out of the way, I dig out of the gym, heading back to Cinnabar Island, and I should be able to defeat Blaine now that I have a few more levels under my belt. I try for Body Slam against the Ninetales, it does less than half. Ninetales uses Flamethrower, which doesn't do very much, I paralyze the Ninetales, and then knock it out. Magmar levels up to level 48, it has a chance to learn Smokescreen, but obviously I don't want this move. Rapidash is next, it takes me down to just above half health, and then chips away with Fire Spin. On the next turn I knock it out, moving on to Blaine's Ace, Arcanine. Body Slam does about a quarter, Arcanine misses Fire Blast, that's convenient. My next Body Slam brings it to half health, paralyzes, but then Arcanine crits with Takedown and Magmar faints. That's its fourth reset. The next fight starts off significantly worse because of confusion. Magmar hits itself so many times. While I do manage to knock out both the Nine Tails as well as the following Rapidash, by the time I'm arriving at the Arcanine I only have 18 hit points left. I tried to use Confuse Ray to mess it up, but it still hits Takedown, getting another critical hit and Magmar faints again. I train up to level 48, and then I go to the Power Plant to retrieve one more rare candy. That being said, I would really like to not use these too early on. After all, Giovanni is next and he is quite intimidating for a fire type. If you have been watching my channel for a long time, you will know that previously I did a Versus video with both Magmar and Electabuzz, and by the standards on my channel today it's quite a bad video. That being said, I really remember from playing both Magmar and Electabuzz that Giovanni was awful, so that's why I'm resisting using rare candies now. As you can see, this is frustrating, because once again Magmar loses to Blaine, this time at the Ninetales due to confusion. In the next fight I make it to the Arcanine with full health, I confuse it, it hits me with takedown, of course it does, doing more than half. I go for Body Slam, taking it to just above half, and I do cause paralysis, but then it snaps out of confusion, uses flamethrower, and does a little bit of damage to Magmar. My next Body Slam takes it to what looks like KO range, Arcanine hits another flamethrower, Magmar survives, and finally finishes off the Fire-type Specialist. His badge is incredibly impactful because now I have a boost to my special stat, and I also have the TM for Fire Blast. Before talking about Giovanni, let's catch up with Electabuzz. After Erica, I decided to go to Sylph to face the rival. I have Psychic to take out the Sandslash. It poisons me, which isn't actually that bad because you only take poison damage if you don't knock out the opposing Pokemon in Generation 1. I do knock out the Sandslash on the next hit, as well as 
as the following Cloister with Thunderbolt. Now the Magneton cannot paralyze me with Thundershock. It could confuse me with Supersonic, but this move is so inaccurate, so I finish it for free. Of course, Body Slam 1 hits the following Kadabra, and then I can use Thunderbolt to two-shot the Flareon. So Electabuzz had a very dominant win in this fight. That being said, I'm going to save before I face Giovanni, because his ground types could actually be problematic. Up first is Nidorino, and of course Psychic One-Shots. Electabuzz at this point has a chance to learn its Elemental Punch, Thunder Punch, but of course this is not useful either, so two of the three Elemental Punches are not going to be used. Persian just barely hangs on after a Thunderbolt, he uses a Guard Spec and I knock it out for free. Alright, Rhyhorn is the first ground type, it takes so much damage and he uses another Guard Spec also free, and while Nidoqueen is a ground type, it just goes for a scratch and I knock it out. My next destination is Koga's Gym. I fight only mandatory trainers and then at level 43 I felt ready to take on the Poison Specialist. Venonat is first, I go for Psychic and knock it out in one critical hit. Okay, Venonat number 2, will I knock this one out as well? And the answer is yes. I move on to the third one which is the highest level but Psychic continues its streak and Electabuzz makes it to the Venomoth without taking any damage. My Psychic does about half, Venomoth gains back a small amount of health with Leech Life and this does let it survive my next attack, that being said it just goes for Toxic and Electabuzz beats Koga. Before facing Blaine, I backtrack to Celadon City to buy a TM for Reflect. I hope that this isn't going to be useful right away. Sometimes it has helped me against Blaine in the past, but I am anticipating that that's not going to be the case with Electabuzz. Ninetales is first, I go for Thunderbolt, and it does just under half. My defense is lowered once by Tail Whip, and then I knock the Ninetales out, moving on to the Rapidash. It has lower special, but still Electabuzz is not able to knock it out in two hits. As a result, Rapidash hits a critical hit stomp, and Electabuzz survives on only six hit points. Arcanine is last, I go for Psychic to hopefully lower its special, and I do, but the Fiery Doggo uses Takedown and Electabuzz faints. I hope everyone is seeing that Blaine is one of the hardest gym leaders in Pokemon Yellow. If you play a lot of Red and Blue, that will make absolutely no sense because he is so bad in those games, but in this game, he just might be the best gym leader. Like I did with Magmar, I go to Saffron City to do some extra training. In this case with Electabuzz, I fight the trainers in Sabrina's gym that have the Slowpoke line. They give good experience and of course Thunderbolt is one-shotting all of them. I expected Sabrina to be roughly the same as she was with Magmar. I'll make a quick note here which is I'm playing the Electabuzz run second. When I did my initial predictions I thought that Magmar would be the best, Electabuzz would be second, and Jinx would be last, just due to its Brock split. To compensate in some ways for how the Pokemon stack up against each other, I play the Pokemon that I think is going to be best first, and then I play the Pokemon that's worst last so I have a little bit more experience when I'm doing that run. With Electabuzz, Sabrina's Alakazam gets a critical hit with Psychic doing so much, but the Electric type just barely survives with 8 hit points and knocks her ace out. Once again, Electabuzz is going to need a high level to finish the game, so I go to the power plant grabbing one more rare candy, and then I defeat all the trainers in Blaine's gym. With them out of the way, I made what I consider to be a very risky choice by using three rare candies before Blaine to get Electabuzz up to level 50. This means I'll finish the game at a slightly lower level, and that could have serious implications later on. That being said, using rare candies now gives me better damage ranges. I'm able to two-hit the Ninetales as well as the Rapidash and move on to the Arcanine with green health. Thunderbolt doesn't quite do half, I have to tank a takedown, my next Thunderbolt takes it to red, it goes for another takedown, Electabuzz survives on 5 hit points, and defeats the fire type gym leader. Okay, once again, I'm gonna make us all wait for Giovanni, because we need to catch up with Jinx. Of course, when we compare the earlier Erica splits, I had not yet done Cycling Road or the Safari Zone, so I have to do that now. Following that, I go to Sylph. The path I take is basically the shortest route I ever do through here. I fight one trainer on the 10th floor to get a Carbos and a Rare Candy. Sometimes I don't pick up the following Calcium, but with Jinx I felt this was the right choice just because I am going to start cutting a lot of optional battles. Pretty much every single optional battle if it's possible. I felt that with an Ice Psychic type I should be able to get through the game very quickly. There aren't a lot of significant threats outside of like Blaine again in the next section of the game. After defeating the trainer who has an Arbok, I realized I needed to do one optional battle, so I fight this guy who's right by the rival who gives exactly enough experience to level up to 35. And then at this early time in the run, I use Rare Candies, 
five of them to take Jinx from level 35 to level 40. This prepares me to take on the Rival. Ice Beam one-shots the Sand Slash, Psychic two hits the following Nine Tails. It does a lot of damage and burns Jinx, by the way. Psychic doesn't do enough to knock out the following Cloister. Luckily, it doesn't confuse me. The Cadaver that follows is likely going to survive my Body Slam because Jinx is pretty weak. So I went with Ice Beam just in case I got the Freeze. I don't. Cadaver just misses Disable and I knock it out. Okay, time for the Jolteon. Remember, it knows Pin Missile, which is super effective. The rival's AI is always going to choose this move, so it goes for it. Jinx is physically frail, and it does a lot of damage hitting three times. Jinx survives on red health. I go for Ice Beam. It does half, and it freezes the Jolteon, which is literally what gives me the win. With no additional optional trainers, I fight Koga next. Stab Psychic is able to one-shot all of the Venonats, of course. I move on to the Venomoth, which I move first against. I didn't think I would one-hit with Psychic, so I go with Ice Beam, just in case. Leech Life heals it a decent amount, but then my Psychic on the next turn knocks it out. I quickly answer all the questions in Blaine's gym, and I'm going to take him on once again without doing any more optional battles. Jinx is level 44, but I think that it has the tools it needs for success. I'm sure you have figured it out. I am going to be relying on Lovely Kiss for this fight. I'm faster than all of Blaine's Pokemon, so I can put them to sleep and then chip away at them using either Ice Beam or Psychic. In this case, I do think that Psychic would have been the better choice against the Ninetales, just in case I lowered its special, but Ice Beam gets the job done either way. I miss my Lovely Kiss on the Rapidash. It does some damage with Takedown before I put it to sleep. Following that, two Ice Beams knock it out, and he sends in his final Pokemon Arcanine. Okay, please, lovely kiss. Okay, it misses. Arcanine uses takedown, and Jinx faints. That said, in the next fight, my final use of lovely kiss does not miss, but I get a Gen 1 miss with Ice Beam on the very next turn. A little bit frustrating because it's stalling out the sleep counter. Nevertheless, I am able to knock the Arcanine out and earn myself the Volcano Badge. With it comes a 12.5% boost to Jinx's special stat, and now this thing is truly ready to shred the late game. I have to take on Sabrina next, and I think that this fight illustrates very well how Jinx plays. In most cases, it can just attack and knock the opponent out, which is the case for the Abra as well as the Kadabra. However, it's a little bit worried about the Pokemon it's facing. It can just use Lovely Kiss to put them to sleep, because Jinx is quite fast, and then it can use one of its other moves, which have good type coverage to knock the opponent out. I get a first attempt victory, and now, at long last, let's see how these Giovanni battles go. With Jinx, things are extremely simple. By the way, I outspeed every one of his Pokémon. The Persian only by one speed, though. Jinx is cutting it close. Ice Beam one-hits the Doug Trio. Then against the Persian, I have to attack twice to knock it out, and I do have my defense lowered by Screech. Nidoqueen is next to go for Ice Beam. It has slightly more base power, and I knock it out. That means the Nidoking is also going to go down, so I have made it to the final Pokémon ride on, and Jinx one-hits it. It clocks in with a final gym split of 47 minutes and 54 seconds. We'll just keep going with the Jinx footage a little bit longer so I can get to the pre-league. Against the final rival, I started to think that maybe I had made a mistake going up against the Jolteon team, because while I get to it with green health, Pin Missile crits doing massive damage and the Jolteon finishes me off on the next turn. In the next fight, I make it back to the Jolteon, but do note that it is faster than Jinx right now. In the battle against the champion, it has 184 speed, so I think I'll be slower there as well. That's not the end of the world though, because I can always let it move first, tank one pin missile, put it to sleep with Lovely Kiss, and knock it out. So in under 50 minutes, Jinx is off towards the league. With Magmar in the Viridian City Gym, I fight two optional trainers to level up to 50. This way I can start using rare candies to give me the maximum possible level against Giovanni. The first five give Magmar the ability to learn Flamethrower, and then the final five bring it up to level 60. Here I teach it Mimic in the place of Confuse Ray. Okay, so let's talk about how I'm going to defeat Giovanni. I can use Flamethrower to one-shot the Doug Trio, and then against the Persian, I am going to Mimic Double Team and set this move up. If you have read my rules, you will know that this strategy is permissible during this fight. In the olden days of my channel, I used to ban the TM for Double Team, but I would allow Pokémon to use evasion boosting moves through other means. So it was permissible to use evasion moves if they were on my level up set, or if I used Mimic to steal them during battle. 
While this year I have tightened my rules on evasion moves, I am still leaving this as the one exception to the rule, just because a weakness to Giovanni's ground type really asymmetrically affects Pokemon that are weak to him, specifically fire, electric, and poison types. In the future I plan to do a lot of research into double team as a move, and into the runs when you don't use double team during this battle, but for now in this video, this strategy is permissible. With it, I am able to use Flamethrower to sweep through Giovanni's team and clock in with my final gym split. Magmar gets a time of 48 minutes and 52 seconds. And then the rival battle before the league is much easier for it when compared with Jinx. I one shot the Sand Slash with Flamethrower, the Execute as well, and then the following Cloister. Magneton was next and I was worried about Thunder Wave but Flamethrower crits. I one shot the Kadabra with Body Slam and all that's left is Flareon and it really can't do much to my Magmar. So at a time of 49 minutes and 43 seconds, Magmar is headed to the league. I I hope everyone knows what that means. Jinx has been able to just barely take the lead. In my videos I never claim to be perfect, so now we are going to watch me stumble around with Electabuzz against Giovanni. I really should have just taught it Mimic in the place of Reflect and then swept his team. In this case I wanted to try the honorable and moral superior strategy by using Reflect to minimize damage from ground type moves and then Psychic to sweep through his team. That being said it actually almost looks like it's working out. I survive the Nidoking's Earthquake on 14 hit points, move on to the Rhydon, but Psychic doesn't have enough damage even with a critical hit, and it knocks me out with Earthquake. Now that fight alone would be only a minor mistake, but I use 4 rare candies and then try again at level 55. Obviously this is not going to work out, so I have another reset. In the next fight you might wonder why I'm not using more rare candies right now like I did with Magmar, and the answer is that the champion is going to be absolutely awful. I am thinking about him a lot right now and that is influencing my decision making. In the end what I decided the strategy had to be here for Electabuzz was Thunderbolt, Psychic, Mimic, and Reflect. Reflect allows me to minimize damage from the Dugtrio, then on the Persian I can set up double team. This badge boosts all of my stats by the way. After that Psychic is going to be doing a lot of damage, well unless I level up. Still it's going to be doing enough damage and I am finally able to defeat Giovanni. In spite of my mistakes, Electabuzz still has a 52 minute and 7 second split. It could be on track right now to clock in with a sub hour time. Before the league though, I have to defeat the rival. This one is not that bad, I can use Mimic to steal Slash. This is good reliable normal type damage whenever I need it. Things get a bit sketchy against the Magneton, it uses Supersonic and Electabuzz hits itself, but eventually I knock it out, one shot the Kadabra with Slash, move on to the Flareon. Thunderbolt does more than half, it just uses Leer, and Electabuzz is off towards the league at a time of 53 minutes and 20 seconds. Despite the stratification of the early and mid game results, everything has collapsed now. The difference between Magmar and Electabuzz's time is actually closer than it was early on into the playthrough. If we extrapolate this into my next playthrough and remove the bad play against Giovanni, Electabuzz and Magmar are looking very similar around this point in the game. There's definitely Magmar time to save around Koga and Blaine. That said, we still have to finish these first playthroughs, so let's see how Electabuzz does in the Elite Four. Things start off easy for the electric type because Lorelei is essentially a water type trainer. The only exception is Jinx. Before making it to it, I slow things down and mimic Slowbro's Amnesia so that I can set up my special attack. This is because I really want to one hit the Jinx and avoid Lovely Kiss. At plus three, I knock the Slowbro out, move on to the Jinx, hit it with Thunderbolt, and it just barely survives and uses Lovely Kiss, which is very frustrating and wastes some time, but Electabuzz wakes up, I knock it out, and obviously I one hit her Ace Lapras. Now I'm going to show you the next fight only a single time in this video, so if you wonder why I left it out, it is because it is extremely easy. Of the three Pokemon that I'm using today, theoretically Electabuzz is the worst in this fight. It doesn't have the same type attack bonus with Psychic like Jinx does, and it can also take super effective damage from both Onix in the form of Dig and Earthquake, but this is all theoretical. Of course it's not actually going to be an issue. While the Machamp survives Psychic and uses Strength, it only does a third and I win. Before the next fight I decided to use Rare Candies to bring Electabuzz up to level 63. This is just going to make everything faster against Agatha. Her first Pokemon is Gengar, Psychic doesn't one hit, it sets up Substitute which is frustrating but I knock it out for free. Thunderbolt one shots the Golbat, I just barely miss the KO on the Haunter. That being said she just uses a Super Potion and I polish it off for free anyways. Arbok goes down to a single Psychic, 
I make it to the final Gengar. The only way I could lose here is if it uses Hypnosis, but in this case it goes for its own Psychic. It does lower Electabuzz's special, but not enough to prevent the KO on the next turn. As I go up against Lance and one-shot his Gyarados with Thunderbolt, you might be wondering why I said Electric types don't do very well in Pokemon Yellow. After all, Electabuzz is completely crushing the league. And don't worry, it is going to crush Lance. After I knock out his first Dragonair, I'm just going to mimic Ice Beam and then sweep his final three Pokemon. The fact that these four battles are so easy for Electabuzz makes what is coming up next all the more frustrating. With Jinx, things are inverted. Lorelei is first, and she's quite slow. She's not going to be an issue. I have Psychic to deal a lot of damage to her Pokemon, and I can also just spam Lovely Kiss to put them to sleep so I take no damage. By the way, against the Cloister, after using Lovely Kiss, I do get a Gen 1 miss on Psychic, which is a little bit annoying. After that, though, I get a critical hit to compensate. Against the Slowbro, I decided not to put it to sleep and just spam Psychic, knocking it out as quickly as possible. After all, Lorelei has AI Modification 2, which is quite rare, and this forces her to use setup moves on the second turn, so I know it's only going to attack me once. That is, if I 3 hit it, and in this case I do. Jinx is next, I use Body Slam, it goes for Thrash, dealing a decent amount, and then I knock it out with my second hit. All that's left is Lapras, now this thing could get a critical hit with Hydro Pump or Body Slam, so I put it to sleep with Lovely Kiss and use Psychic to knock it out over three turns. Definitely an easy battle for Jinx, but you can see that it took much more time when compared with Electabuzz. The following two trainers are very easy for Jinx. By the time I defeat Agatha's Gengar, I level up to 58 where I can learn Blizzard, but I don't think I need it. Jinx is going to have enough damage with Ice Beam to defeat Lance. Before that fight, I use my final rare candy, and now let's see how this one goes. The hardest Pokemon that Jinx has to face is the Gyarados. I guess it could KO me if it gets a crit with Hyper Beam, but it goes for Hydro Pump instead, doing about a third. I knock it out with my second Psychic, and from there, Jinx sweeps with four uses of Ice Beam. While we watch that footage play out, I will mention that Jinx has 175 speed, which is just 5 points higher than Aerodactyl. If I had been several levels lower, it could have knocked me out with its own Hyper Beam, and it has a very high crit rate because Aerodactyl has very high base speed. But while Jinx has enough speed in this fight, it won't for the champion's Jolteon. For the league, we have been going easiest to hardest so far, and of course Magmar starts off with the worst matchup. While Fire-type moves are super effective against Ice-type Pokémon, but when paired with the Water-type, as is the case on Lorelei's team, I'm only going to be doing neutral damage. Here I need to draw your attention to a glitch, which is the Type Misinformation glitch. So here the game is printing the message it's not very effective. That is not actually the case, it is just displaying the wrong text, when in fact my fire type moves are dealing super effective damage. I make it past the Cloister without taking any damage, move on to the Slowbro where I use Mimic to steal Amnesia. It's going to set up on the second turn, meaning it's using Withdraw, so it can really only attack me on the first turn or the third turn. In this case it didn't attack on the first turn so I got the best possible scenario, and by the time it finally uses Surf, it's dealing very little damage. Plus, it's only ever going to use this move 50% of the time, so this felt safe to me. After setting up to plus 6, I use Psychic to knock it out in 2 hits, and move on to the Jinx. Obviously, Flamethrower one-shots it, as well as her final Pokémon. With Magmar, I arrive at Agatha at the same level I was with Electabuzz, 63, and this fight is very easy just using Psychic. Now I'm not showing the footage to insult your intelligence. I want to take this time to set up what is coming next. Likely the hardest battle in the entire run for this fire type. Lance has AI Modification 3, meaning he will always choose moves that are super effective. His Gyarados is a water type, and it knows the move Hydro Pump, which is its only water type move, and the only move it has that is super effective against Magmar. This means it will spam Hydro Pump, never choosing another move. In Generation 1, the AI does not have PP, so it cannot run out of Hydro Pump, and it also gets the same type attack bonus, so it's going to do a lot of damage. Gyarados is also decently fast, so 15.82% of the time it is going to get critical hits, and I expect when that happens it will one-shot Magmar. My hope is right now at this level I will be able to two-shot with Psychic or Body Slam. That being said, there are a lot of ways for Magmar to luck out in the next fight, which is why I did not level more. Gyarados could miss, Magmar could lower Special with Psychic and survive the second Hydro Pump, Body Slam could cause Paralysis and prevent Gyarados from moving, and I could also just get a straight up critical hit and knock it out in one turn. Okay, so with all of that set up, now let's see how Magmar does against Lance. So the first question is how much damage will Psychic do, and the answer is more than half, 
only in the case that it gets a critical hit. Okay, that means this fight is probably going to need some luck. And I don't get it in the first fight, because Gyarados crits with Hydro Pump, knocking Magmar out in a single hit, as I predicted. I assume that I'm going to need to try this fight many times until things line up the way I need them to. But in the next fight, I get a critical hit right away, and I drop Gyarados's special. This means Hydro Pump does less than half. And also, my next Psychic is going to deal more damage, so Lance's lead goes down. I didn't want to get too confident right away though, because the first Dragoner can use Thunder Wave and really mess the rest of the fight up. Body Slam does not do enough to knock it out, but I cause Paralysis and it fails to move. Okay, so I am not paralyzed and I'm moving on to the Dragonair. It cannot freeze me with Ice Beam, but it could lower my speed because it's always going to be using Bubble Beam. That being said, it doesn't get the speed drop. I'm able to successfully mimic Ice Beam and knock it out. I move faster than the Aerodactyl, finishing it in one turn, and I also knock out the Dragonite. Alright, Magmar had the luck it needed to get by Lance with only a single reset. I want to keep the momentum going, let's jump right into the battle against the champion. Mirroring Lance, this battle starts out badly for Magmar because the champion leads with Sand Slash and it is always going to be using Earthquake. My Flamethrower just barely does not get the knockout, but it does conveniently get a burn, which cuts Sandslash's attack stat in half, meaning that its follow-up Earthquake does only a third. I finish it off, moving on to the Alakazam. I use Body Slam against it, and I was expecting the one hit, but I just barely don't get it. It uses Psy Beam, doing a little bit, and I finish it off. Next is Executor, Flamethrower, Crit, knocking it out in one turn. I think without the crit, that would have taken two. Magneton is next, Flamethrower does half, remember this thing is not a steel type in generation 1. It goes for Thunderbolt, taking Magmar to red health, and I knock it out. Okay, so I actually might do this if I can one-shot the Cloister. It has low special, but it survives Flamethrower with orange health, and uses Clamp, which knocks Magmar out. Okay, let's try this out with Fire Blast. Unfortunately, in this fight, Alakazam was able to lower my special, so I'm not able to knock the Cloister out, but it misses Clamp. Okay, that's perfect. I can use Psychic to finish it off and move on to the champion's final Pokemon, Flareon. Because of his AI, he's not going to choose his fire moves against me. He's going to be using either Reflect or Quick Attack. Unfortunately, it goes for Quick Attack, and it does enough damage to get the knockout. I am really hoping that I can do this on my next attempt. The clock is swiftly approaching an hour, and I would like to clock in under that threshold if possible. Fire Blast 1 hits the Sand Slash. Against Alakazam, I use Body Slam getting a lucky critical hit. Fire Blast knocks out the Executor in a single hit, which is a guarantee by the way, I did not need that crit. After that against the Magneton, I only have a 77% chance to one hit, so in this case the critical hit was helpful. Now the damage range against the Cloister is a bit unfortunate, by the way I'm checking these ranges in post. I only have a 51% chance to knock it out in one turn, but this time I get it, so I have full health against the Flareon, Body Slam does more than half, and with that, our first Pokemon clocks in. Magmar gets a first playthrough time of 56 minutes and 59 seconds, with 9 resets at level 68. This is a game time of 3 hours and 28 minutes. This is a great first result for the Fire type, and I am really excited to play it again and see just how low I can get the time. Now, as you've probably anticipated, things are really bad for Electabuzz at the beginning of the champion fight. I need to knock the Sand Slash out using Psychic. Luckily for me, it is going to be a 2 hit. But just observe how much damage Earthquake does. From full health, it takes Electabuzz to the red. The complications don't end here. Because of my current moveset, Thunderbolt, Psychic, Mimic, and Reflect, I don't have a physical move for the following Alakazam. That means it's going to attack at least once. Thunderbolt does more than half, it uses Psychic, and Electabuzz faints. The reason I have kept Reflect on my set is specifically for this battle, so I can minimize damage from Earthquake. That being said, if I do this, I still just have to attack twice with Psychic, and Electabuzz ends up in essentially the same scenario. I don't have access to recovery through rest because I deleted that move, but I could mimic recover from Alakazam. Though that won't work if it attacks with Psychic. Now Psychic is doing more than half to the Sand Slash every single time I use it. What that means is if I get a critical hit, I will knock it out in one turn. Electabuzz is fast, so roughly 1 in 5 fights I will get this, and at this point in the run, I was essentially just banking on that. 
If the Alakazam uses Psychic, I'll just reset right away and go back into the fight hoping for a crit. I can speed up my progress if I reset right away after failing to get a critical hit. That said, in the next fight I survive with orange health and I figured I wanted to play this out. Then I have my accuracy lowered by the Alakazam. This is generally why just resetting and trying again for the good luck is the better play. If you end up losing like this, a lot of time is bled and I could have rolled for a critical hit against the Sandslash maybe two or three times in this duration. With 10 resets in just over an hour and one minutes on the clock, Electabuzz gets the crit it needs and the champion's lead falls. Alakazam is next, I get even better luck here because Kinesis misses, so I take no damage and move on to the Executor. I don't have good damage against this Grass Psychic type, so I'm going to use Mimic to steal Hypnosis, put it to sleep, set up with Reflect so that its Stomp and Barrage can't do very much to me, and then slowly chip away at it using Thunderbolt. The Magneton that's next is only going to use Swift and Screech. I should have just attacked it right away and finished it off as fast as possible. I use Hypnosis here, which is objectively a mistake. It wastes some time, but overall it's not the worst thing in the world because his final two Pokemon are also quite easy. I one-shot the Cloister with Thunderbolt and two-shot his final Flareon. Electabuzz clocks in with a first playthrough time of 1 hour 2 minutes and 4 seconds with 10 resets at level 65. This is a game time of 3 hours and 47 minutes minutes. Last year after optimizing Jolteon it was able to get a time of 1 hour 1 minute and 10 seconds with 2 resets at level 71 with a game time of 3 hours and 59 minutes. Electabuzz is going to get a better result than that. It's not that it's better than Jolteon, this just shows how much I've improved over the last 12 months. That being said, it could be the case that Electabuzz is better than Jolteon overall because access to Psychic is very helpful especially against the champion's Sandslash. But we still need to see how Jinx does against the champion, so let's clock in our final Pokemon. Against the Sandslash, it is now not an issue at all because Ice Beam one hits. Then Alakazam is also not an issue. By the way, if you're wondering why my animations are suddenly turned on, the champion battle automatically does this. I think the developers wanted it to feel more intense than any other battle in the game, and personally I love the fact that animations are on. I had to make the decision at some point not to turn them off with Game Hook because that is a possibility, but I think overall aesthetically having animations on here just feels fitting. Because I can put the Psychic type to sleep, I just knock it out. Against the Executor due to my typing, it will never use Hypnosis, so I can just spam Ice Beam here to finish it off, with a critical hit speeding things up. Cloyster is next and it has low-ish special. Psychic doesn't one-shot it, it goes for Clamp. This only hits twice doing a small amount of damage and I knock it out. Against Ninetales, I'm going to put it to sleep so it doesn't crit with Fire Spin. That would be very unfortunate. Ice Beam knocks it out over three turns and I move on to the Jolteon. With 181 speed, that is three less. As a result, it moves first, hits Pin Missile, which is a physical move. However, it doesn't do very much. It's not a very good move. Lovely Kiss puts it to sleep. Sleep. Jolteon wakes up right away. My Psychic does less than half. Okay, it's gonna get another hit in. This time Pin Missile takes me under half health. I managed to put his Ace back to sleep, take it down to red health, and now because this is Generation 1 sleep, I have won. So, Jinx clocks in with a final time of 55 minutes and 31 seconds, with 4 resets at level 61. This is a game time of 3 hours and 33 minutes. These results side by side are a little bit shocking for me. I thought that Jinx wasn't going to come close to Magmar. I figured the ranking would be Magmar, Jinx, and then Electabuzz. That being said, Jinx gets the fastest first playthrough time. Magmar is roughly a minute and a half behind it, and Electabuzz trails the ice type by 6 and a half minutes. Mirroring the real-time results, the resets are highest for Electabuzz and lowest for Jinx. That makes sense because in general a higher reset counter correlates to a higher real-time. I say in general because we're going to see a couple reasons why that's not always the case. In terms of level, things don't line up as well. Jinx finished at 61, Electabuzz at 65, and Magmar at level 68. Also, Magmar was able to get the lowest game time, which means through optimization perhaps it will squeeze out a small lead over Jinx. The splits do a good job of demonstrating just how dominant Jinx is in the late game. All of its splits there are very short, especially the champion, whereas Magmar took more than twice as much time, and Electabuzz of course took the longest. Coming back to the real time by Trainer Graph, we can see how stratified they were earlier on, and then everything collapsed around the Giovanni split, putting Magmar and Jinx on roughly the same path throughout the game until Magmar took just slightly longer against the champion, losing out to Jinx who is more consistent there. 
Unfortunately for all the electric type fans, Electabuzz stayed about the same amount of time behind Magmar throughout the late game. But I don't want to draw too much negativity to its results, because as an electric type I think it did quite well. So let's jump into its follow up playthrough and see how low I was able to get its time. For this playthrough I'm going to explain the goal, and then I will describe in depth how I achieve it. When I did analysis of Electabuzz's former champion battle, I realized that its level was not high enough to guarantee a knockout even if it crit the Sand Slash. I only had a 13.54% chance for that to happen, so for this follow up playthrough I am targeting a finish level that will guarantee me a knockout if I get a critical hit. I don't want to face the champion reset over and over and over again to get a critical hit, and then when I finally manage to get the luck I need, not knock the sand slash out and fail as a result. Of course I did investigate other options to make the champion more consistent. Using body slam is obviously not a good idea because I would need to be level 88 to two shot the sand slash consistently. By this level psychic would have an 88% chance to one hit, so obviously body slam is the inferior move. That being said, did you hear what I said? Psychic does not have a guaranteed one hit at level 88. Its chance to knock out doesn't actually improve until Electabuzz gets to level 82. So doing all of that training doesn't actually achieve a faster result. You might wonder about the efficacy of Double Edge. Well it's going to two hit at level 82, but I'm also going to be taking recoil damage, and I would have to do the additional training as well. In order to guarantee Psychic one hits when it crits, I need to be exactly level 68. And that is going to be my target for this playthrough. Brock of course is the first thing we need to talk about. I'm going to go into this one at the same level I did last time. That being said, this is not consistent. I am cutting corners here in order to get a better final result with Electabuzz. That being said, leveling up to 15 you can still lose, so I don't think that that's a better alternative. In the early game I fought the first two bug catchers, the last in Viridian Forest, I backtracked and faced the rival on Route 22, and then I fought the final two bug catchers as well as 13 wild encounters. These consisted of 8 Caterpie, 3 Metapod, and 2 Pidgey. After defeating the junior trainer in Brock's gym, I level up to level 13, and now I am ready for my first gym battle. Against the Geodude I only want to use Leer once, this is because if I wanted to further improve my damage ranges, I would have to use it two more times. Then if I get a critical hit I will deal less damage, and I will bleed turns during the battle, allowing Electabuzz to take more damage. So the highest chance to win against the Geodude while preserving health is one Leer followed by Quick Attack. The Onyx that follows is a different story, you really want this thing to go for bide right away, and drop it to minus 6 defense as soon as is possible, then Quick Attack does a lot of damage, and Electabuzz can knock it out fairly quickly. That being said, the Onyx can just knock me out if it uses things like Bind or Screech too much in combination with its physical moves. You can see that here when it hits Tackle taking me down to 7 hit points, but of course I restarted this playthrough until I got what I needed, and I clock in with Electabuzz's first split of 8 minutes and 4 seconds. That's not much different than my first result, that being said all the time savings come later in the game. Game. On Route 3 I fight the Bug Catcher for extra experience, in Mount Moon I fight one optional trainer, the Super Nerd, and then I face the rival in Cerulean City. The most annoying thing about this fight is that I have roughly a 51% chance to knock out the Sand Shrew in two hits with Mega Punch. Other than that all of his other Pokemon are very easy. So the loss condition is getting hit by Sand Attack. I make a change just before reaching Bill's house, which is to fight one optional Hiker to expose the TM for Seismic Toss. As you saw when I reached the champion previously, not having access to a recovery move, did hamper my chances of success. Things there will be much easier if I can save rest for later on in the run, and use Seismic Toss for now to defeat the self-destructing hiker in Rock Tunnel. Also it does help against Misty so that I don't have to use an inaccurate move like Mega Punch. On the SSN I grab Rest as well as Body Slam, defeat the rival, crush Surge, and move into the mid game. As I said before, I'm going to use Seismic Toss against the self-destructing hiker. By the way, I want to note just how well all of this experience works out until this point in the playthrough. Fighting minimum battles with the exceptions that I have mentioned to this this point means that Electabuzz levels up to 29 right as the self-destructing hiker sends out Graveler. This is very important because it has exactly 57 health, meaning at level 28 you will not two-shot with Seismic Toss, but at level 29 I do. Lately I have been thinking a lot about how mid-game training is critical for a run's success, so I'm going to summarize every optional battle I do with Electabuzz. Just after Rock Tunnel I fight this super nerd who has two Grimer and one Muck, then I go into the hideout collecting the rare candy but not too many items, so I can only buy two calcium in the department store. By the way, I did think about iron, but that's actually not important, I'll talk about why later. I grab Psychic and before leaving Saffron City I defeat all of the trainers in the fighting dojo. 
Then on Cycling Road, I take this path to fight high experience yield trainers. There are three near the top of the route. All of them are very quick because Electabuzz has access to Psychic. Then I fight two trainers with fighting types heading south, as well as the guy with five Pokemon. Inside Erica's gym, I fight the cool trainer. This is not technically an optional battle. I have to fight one person in here. She just turns out to give more experience than the person with only Execute. After that, I crush Erica, and then I fight all of these trainers in Sylph. I can't talk about each one individually, but overall they give good experience, and they're fairly fast for Electabuzz to knock out. All of this grinding brings it up to level 43 to face the rival, and I won't have to use any rare candies because of that. This fight went about as well as it could have, because Electabuzz crits three times. And it's worth noting, for all of the Pokémon that it did crit against, I would have had to knock them out over two turns, and then the two Pokémon it didn't crit against, I was gonna one-hit them in. Anyways, I love it when the luck lines up like that. Because I'm in Saffron City, I do not want to backtrack here later, so I go into the gym and fight one optional trainer, and then take on Sabrina. I don't have enough speed to move first against Alakazam, but as long as it doesn't crit, which of course is what happens right away, that's one reset. Anyways, as long as it doesn't crit or use Psychic two times in a row, I'm going to win. Plus, Body Slam has the upside of paralyzing, which will give me the outspeed on the next turn. In Koga's Gym, I fight one optional trainer, this guy. His Sand Slash doesn't have any ground type moves, so he's good experience. Koga's Venonats are all guaranteed one hits, and I have a two hit on the Venomoth. It cannot one shot me under any circumstance. Without fighting any other trainers, I'm going to use 10 rare candies now to boost Electabuzz from level 48 up to level 58 before facing and completely destroying Blaine. Because of another critical hit, all of his Pokemon should have been two hits. No more optional trainers before Giovanni. In this case, I can use Body Slam to one-hit the Dugtrio, and then set up with Double Team on the Persian. Rare Candying to 58, fighting Blaine and the two optional trainers in the Viridian City Gym, means that I won't level up at all during this fight, so I have my badge boosts and I can one-hit the Rhydon with Psychic. In Victory Road, I fight five more trainers. The two cool trainers in the first area, the tamer just before going down the ladder, the cool trainer with Chansey, and finally the guy with three water types. I pick up the rare candy in the power plant, sweep through the league, and once Electabuzz defeats the Dragonite, it levels up to exactly level 66. Having the power plant candy means I have two rare candies left over, and I can use both of them now to reach level 68. I also teach Electabuzz two new moves, and then I'm ready for the champion. My moveset is Psychic, Thunderbolt, Rest, and Reflect. Reflect for the first turn to minimize damage from Earthquake, because what I figured out is I can roll the dice for critical hits against both the Sand Slash and the Alakazam. If Electabuzz just crits one of them, then I will win, and the Alakazam could just spam Recover, not KO with Psybeam, or miss a Kinesis. So it makes sense to try to fight it. In this case, I don't crit the Sand Slash, but I knock it out in two turns, surviving on Orange Health. Next is Alakazam, I go for Thunderbolt, and I get the crit, knocking it out. From there, the fight is so much easier because I have rest. The Executor is not going to do much damage because I have Reflect in place, so I can heal up, take my time, move on eventually to the final Jolteon, finish it off, and clock in. Electabuzz gets a final time of 52 minutes and 56 seconds, with one reset at level 69. This is a game time of 3 hours and 28 minutes. Interestingly enough, that is the same game time that Magmar had in its first playthrough. That being said, in the second run with Electabuzz, I was able to get a substantially better time than the first playthroughs with both Magmar and Jinx. I am really happy with this Electabuzz result. The only thing that went wrong during this attempt was a reset against Sabrina, and there could have been resets against the champion. I think this is a very representative run of peak potential for this Electabuzz route, so let's rank it in my tier list. Before I bring the graphic on the screen, I'm just going to mention from here on out there will be spoilers for all of my previous videos. Check those out first if you're worried. Today with its time, Electabuzz is slower than Flareon, Arbok, and Lickitung, but it's faster than Weezing, Gyarados, and Kadabra, so it earns itself the middle spot of the B tier. Next, let's see how Jinx does. This run I came up with a very specific solution for the early game, which is by far the hardest spot for Jinx. In Viridian Forest, I'm going to fight the first bug catcher with two Caterpie. I'm going to skip the next one because he has two Metapod, and fight the yellow version exclusive bug catcher. After that, I fight the mandatory bug catcher and head into the Pewter City Gym to face the junior trainer. I'm going to do blackout training here, so knock out the Diglett, and then faint to the Sandshrew so I get trainer boosted experience over and over. I'm going to gain 
gain levels a lot faster doing things this way than fighting wild Pokemon in Viridian Forest. It's worth noting with some Pokemon that this provides less stat experience, so sometimes that can change one or two damage ranges against Brock, but for Jinx it doesn't matter, I'm going to have to get lucky against Brock anyways. I defeat the Junior Trainer and my Jinx is level 12, so I go back to the forest. Now I'm going to backtrack facing the trainers that I skipped, the second Bug Catcher, as well as the last by the entrance to the forest. Because I'm already headed south, I go all the way to the rival on Route 22, defeating him for more experience, which brings Jinx up to level 14. After that, I only have to train one more level in the forest to get level 15, where I face Brock. Now all of that gets me here in just over 11 minutes of time, still this fight I do need to get lucky in. As you will note, I knock the Geodude out and Jinx only has 8 hit points left. What needs to happen is the Onyx has to go for Bide, and I have to trap it with Lovely Kiss early on. In this case it goes for Screech followed by Bind, which is really not what I wanted to do, but then Onyx uses Bide, and uh, we're going to speed the footage up a lot, so if uh, visual stuff causes you to get like sick or anything like that, look away right now, because this fight takes a while, but I do manage to chain Lovely Kiss long enough and knock the Onyx out. Using this strategy, Jinx is able to clock in with a 12 minute and 5 second Brock split. Honestly, that's pretty good. From here things get easier, but not that much. I have to beat Misty. She can be inconsistent with Jinx, but without a reset here, the rest of the run just gets so much smoother. With Bubble Beam, all of Nugget Bridge is incredibly fast. Then we are going to skip to Celadon City, where I also just completely bypass the Rocket Hideout. I'm going to buy two Carbos. These are a little bit important for later on. They're more convenient than anything else. Jinx does very little optional training in the mid game. The Biker on Cycling Road, then the Cool Trainer in Erika's Gym, also the Tamer in Koga's Gym. After that, I am level 37, and I can use three rare candies to go up to level 40. This, with the Carbos from the department store, gives me just enough speed to move first against Koga's Venomoth. It wasn't really that much of a threat, but I like this added little bit of consistency. With Jinx, there isn't really a reason not to get it, because you don't need to save rare candies for later on. Leveling up is not how this thing is going to win the game. You can see that here against the rival in Sylph, I basically just need to put the right Pokemon to sleep. In this case, the right Pokemon is the Jolteon. With it asleep, I can knock it out and move on with my run. Next I take on Sabrina, but first I use 4 rare candies to boost Jinx to level 48. After that I knock out the Alakazam, I am faster than all of Blaine's Pokemon, so unless I miss with a lovely kiss and he hits a big fire type move, I'm not worried here either. Now, I fought the Hypno Sandwich Trainer in Sylph, and I'm also going to fight one more optional trainer here in the Viridian City Gym, which brings Jinx up to level 50. Also know where my experience bar is, it's about halfway. This is a small detail that I added to the run. When I defeat Giovanni's Nido Queen, I level up to 51, which gives me a guaranteed one hit on the Nido King, which formerly was a 93% chance to knock out. The rival before the league is fairly straightforward. I'm going to mimic Slash here for a good normal type move. It also has guaranteed crits when used by Jinx. It speeds up the knockout on the Kadabra mostly. After that, the Jolteon gets a crit with Pin Missile after Lovely Kiss fails, and I do have one reset here. Note that I've planned this fight out so that Jinx will be at a level where it will outspeed his final Pokemon. So when Lovely Kiss works, this fight is not an issue. I steamroll the league, and after I defeat Lance's Dragonite, Jinx is level 58. Alright, so let's talk about the champion. For this one, Lovely Kiss on the Sand Slash to put it to sleep, then Mimic to steal Earthquake for super effective damage later in the fight. Ice Beam knocks it out, against the Alakazam put it to sleep, use Earthquake for physical damage to take it down in two turns, against Executor I can just spam Ice Beam, I put the Cloister to sleep with Lovely Kiss and knock it out with Psychic, luckily getting a critical hit in this case. Ninetales I also put to sleep especially right now because I'm poisoned, Fire Spin would be devastating. It goes down and all that's left is the Jolteon. The loss condition here is a critical hit with Pin Missile or perhaps a 5 turn. But the thing about Pin Missile is that it also can miss. So in this case it does, I put the Jolteon to sleep and Earthquake knocks it out with Jinx surviving on a single hit point. Please do note that this whole battle would be much more consistent if I wasn't poisoned right away, so we were essentially watching one of the worst case scenarios. Even in that case, Jinx clocks in with a final time of 49 minutes and 22 seconds with one reset at level 59. This is a game time of 3 hours and 12 minutes. 
So the Psychic Ice type was able to squeeze its way into the A tier. It has a result that is slower than Kangaskhan, Hitmonlee, Poliwrath, and Raticate, but faster than Pinsir. It is worth stating that it was only 4 seconds faster than Pinsir, but it did have 2 minutes less game time, and it finished the game 1 level higher, plus I did 8 playthroughs with Pinsir and I only did 4 with Jinx, so I do think that it should be ranked ahead. I think my closing thoughts on this Pokemon is just that I wish it started with Ice Punch. If it did, it would be an S tier Pokemon, undoubtedly. So now with two of the three Pokemon ranked, we are coming back to the one that I started the video with. How can Magmar do? Is it in fact going to be the savior of the fire type, or will it succumb to its type's general weaknesses in Kanto? Let's see. As was previously the case, Brock is very straightforward. At just level 10, Ember does more than enough damage to defeat him. Really the only way Magmar loses here is if the Onyx goes for Bide, you have to attack into it and it pays back too much damage. In Mount Moon I fight the Super Nerd, the Bug Catcher, as well as the Last, they're all fast knockouts, and then I grab Mega Punch and head on to Cerulean City. At level 17, I have a 2 hit with Ember against the Sand True. That still gives it one turn to use Sand Attack, and in this case, that is enough. The Rattata's Hyper Fang does a lot of damage. I miss a lot, and it finishes me with Quick Attack. That's an early and frustrating reset. If there were two resets, I would have restarted the run, but there aren't, so I make it by him on my next attempt. At the end of Nugget Bridge, I'm going to mirror Electabuzz's path and pick up the TM for Seismic Toss. This move is what enables me to fight Misty right away with Magmar. I will two-shot the Staryu and three-shot the Starmie. There are two loss conditions here, if the Starmie spams Bubble Beam too much, or if it gets a critical hit. In this case, it knocks me out with Bubble Beam. That said, the lost time here is going to be roughly equivalent to the amount of time I would have spent walking to Vermilion City after digging back. On the Assassin, I grab Body Slam, and then I get Rest. I'm doing it in this order specifically so I have the more powerful Normal-type move to defeat the Sailor's Water-type Pokémon. With this strategy, I can't use Rest for the Hiker in the Tunnel, however Ember really should be up to the task. It's going to 2-hit both of his Geodudes and likely 3-hit the Graveler. Unfortunately for me, this means it gets one more turn to use Self-Destruct and knock Magmar out. This run is the opposite of the Electabuzz run. It feels like everything is going wrong right now. Also do note, because I didn't need as high of a level for Magmar to defeat Brock, I am not level 29 for the Graveler, so it's going to be a 3-hit even if I use Seismic Toss. The reason I'm using Ember first turn is just in case a burn, in which case self-destruct will deal half damage. With Magmar, I explore the rocket hideout, grabbing an extra rare candy, and then with the extra money this area gave me, I'm able to buy 5 calcium. This will improve Psychic's damage later on, when it's going to be very important. And then I do optional training on Cycling Road, and I want to bring your attention to the trainers that I am fighting. I am obviously not taking on the correct mid-game trainers, and that's because this run with Magmar I filmed all the way back in August. We can see another suboptimal section of training where I battle a bunch of trainers in Erica's gym. I really should be just fighting the cool trainer here. In Sylph my training is better, but the damage is kind of already done. I have bled so much time fighting a bunch of people with terrible experience yields. There was a goal for this time investment though, and that is to get Magmar to level 43 without rare candies before the rival in Sylph. Doing this means I can two-shot the Sandslash, two-shot the Cloister, and with that the rest of the fight is much easier. Koga is obviously straightforward, even without the critical hit I would have won this battle. And that brings Magmar up to level 47. The next gym leader I'm going to face is Sabrina, and before I do that I use 10 rare candies to bring Magmar up to level 57. This allows it to learn Flamethrower along the way. While I don't have a one hit on the Alakazam, its best damage range with a critical hit from Psychic, it will only do 69% damage to me, which is not nice enough for Sabrina to give her a win. Against Blaine, Magmar has Psychic, which is usually quite good against his Pokemon because it can lower Special. I can also use Body Slam on the Rapidash for a 2-hit. As is usually the case with Blaine, when you think he's not going to be that difficult, I have a resistance from his primary typing. He ends up being a little bit difficult. Magmar almost has a reset here, but luckily the Arcanine goes for a Reflect. That brings my Fire type up to level 58, and this is the level that I want it to be at to face Giovanni. Here, obviously, Mimic Double Team, set up, and then sweep his team. Things get really close once again, but I manage to pull it off. Alright, so let's jump ahead to the next difficult trainer, which of course is Lance. I want everyone to check out the time right now. It is just after 47 minutes as this fight starts. So Magmar is still possibly in the running for a sub-50 minute time. However, I am going to have to get some luck here. 
Against the Gyarados I am using Body Slam because it has a higher chance to knock out than Psychic. I have a 32% chance to 2 hit, and the Gyarados can also miss a Hydro Pump. Either one of those scenarios is what I'm looking for. Alternatively, I could paralyze the Gyarados and have it miss an attack, but in this case I crit it. However, the next Dragonair uses Thunder Wave, paralyzing Magmar, then uses Hyper Beam, taking me down to 1 hit point, and the second one finishes me off. That is 5 resets total with Magmar. Alright, come on. In the next fight, Gyarados misses Hydro Pump, and then I get a critical hit, knocking it out for free. The first Dragonair does not paralyze, and from there I mimic Ice Beam and sweep the final three Pokémon on Lance's team. For the Champion fight, I have a very different moveset. I've added Rest in the place of Body Slam and Fire Blast in the place of Flamethrower. I am going to use Mimic to steal Earthquake from the Sand Slash. I will tank one Earthquake, which brings Magmar down to orange health, and then I am going to one-hit the Sand Slash with Fire Blast. At level 65, this is a guarantee as long as Fire Blast hits. Following that, I can use Earthquake for an 85% chance to knock out the Alakazam, and move on to the Executor, where I can use Rest. After waking up, I have a 72% chance to knock it out with Fire Blast, which I get in this case, and then I can use Earthquake for the guaranteed one hit on the Magneton. That crit that I got was not required. Next is Cloyster. Unfortunately, I only have a 35% chance to knock it out, but today I roll a crit, and this one did matter. All that's left is Flareon. I'm not at low health, so it can't quick attack me. And as a result, Magmar clocks in with its second playthrough time, a time of 49 minutes and 15 seconds, with 5 resets at level 66. This is a game time of 3 hours and 8 minutes. I hope that the feeling you had watching this entire Magmar run was like, Scott, this doesn't feel very good, there's a lot of bad luck, and this route isn't as optimized as it could be. This is going to unfairly disadvantage Magmar when compared with Jinx and Electabuzz. Yeah, even despite that, Magmar pulls out the fastest time of the three. It is only 7 seconds faster than Jinx, but the fact that I did this on my second run, with a poorly optimized mid-game, really convinced me that Magmar is the best of these three. The previous Jinx result was in my third playthrough, and the final Electabuzz run in this video was my fourth playthrough with it. So today, we are crowning Magmar the champion of the three elemental punch Pokémon. I am really happy a Fire-type was able to perform this well. Playing Magmar has definitely made me like and respect this typing a lot more. The results that it earned today are faster than both Pinsir and now Jinx, but slower than Raticate, Polyrath, Hitmonlee, and Kangaskhan. So today it earns itself the third last spot in the A tier. And as things currently stand, it is the second place Fire-type Pokémon with only Ninetales ahead of it. And honestly, Ninetales is sort of a beast. It makes sense that it is faster. Of course, today is December 1st, so Daily December is starting on my channel. For the entire month, there will be one video every day. Starting tomorrow, over the next three days, I will be playing the game with the starter Pokémon. Bulbasaur, Charmander, and finally Squirtle. Thank you so much if you support me on Patreon or through YouTube memberships, it really means the world to me. Now, while we watch the credits play out, we need to see how these three Pokémon do against Professor Oak. Electabuzz by far has the fight the easiest. It can set up Reflect against the Tauros and then knock it out with two hits. After that, the Executor slows things down a little bit, and it can be annoying if it chooses Hypnosis. But three body slams later, I knock it out, move on to the Arcanine, and this thing is quite incompetent, I'm gonna finish it off. Venusaur is weak to Electabuzz's Psychic, and of course Lance's Ace Gyarados goes down to a single Thunderbolt. Jinx, on the other hand, feels a little bit more luck-reliant, because I'm going to want to put the Arcanine to sleep using Lovely Kiss. I made the decision just to attack the Charizard, hoping that I would get the one hit. I don't, but I do cause a freeze, so that is ideal. Following that, I'm going to put the Gyarados to sleep as well, just in case Hyper Beam. Now, it wakes up before I finish it off, but once again, Jinx freezes. Those two were relatively easy victories, and I think both of those Pokémon have paths to victory in most fights against Oak. I cannot say the same thing for Magmar. One of Oak's teams has two Water-type Pokémon, Blastoise and Gyarados. If you thought the Gyarados against Lance was annoying, yeah, I have to deal with another one, and it is a higher level this time. It's actually the highest level trainer-controlled Pokémon in all of the game's data. My solution, as you can see for this, is to mimic Hypnosis and use it against the two Water-types to put them to sleep, preventing Hydro Pump from hitting and allowing Magmar to win. Do you feel unsatisfied with Magmar? Do you feel like it deserves another playthrough? 
because I did. So before recording the final day of audio, which I am doing right now, by the way, I came back and did two more playthroughs with it just to sort out the mid-game experience. In the end, this saves a lot of time. I didn't get a perfectly lucky playthrough like Electabuzz, but I was able to push the fire type's time down even more to 48 minutes and 5 seconds. It had four resets and it finished the game at level 67. This is with a game time of three hours and three minutes. With this new result, I'm going to make an update to my tier list to place Magmar just behind Hitmonlee and ahead of Polyrath. In the end, Magmar only trails nine tails by just over one minute, so it did very well. Thanks so much everyone for watching. If you made it this far in the video, you are incredible. I will see you tomorrow for another one.